Hey guys, Hu Shang here. Welcome to another StarCraft 2 lesson. Today we're going to be talking about attacking. So there's a lot of questions I get asked from students about how to attack. You know, what unit should you be making? How should you set up your production? Should I have like a backup plan? Um, lots of stuff like that. And so we're going to be looking at uh, a little situation I set up here in the unit tester just to kind of address like the basics of attacking. So I think it's easiest to look at a PvP situation because it's balanced to kind of understand the concept. But the thing, same thing is going to apply to the other matchups as well. Just um, it'll be more asymmetrical. So this will be better as an example. All right. So in the unit tester here, you can see that on this side, we have a Protoss player. And the Protoss player has uh, two Robo Bays, a Forge, and a uh, Robo Bay. So a lot of money invested in tech here. And we also have five stalkers. And then if we look at this other side, they have the exact same thing. And what you should realize is these guys have literally the exact same amount of units because it's a mirror matchup. And so if you were wanting to attack here, it wouldn't really work because you don't have more units. Um, and on top of that, your opponent has defender's advantage, right? So they'll usually have the uh, overcharge, of course. But then on top of that, they have a faster warp in point. And so the reinforcements are going to arrive quicker. And then, um, yeah, you're not going to be able to make any headway because, again, you have the same number of units. So if you want to be doing attacks, you really want to cut things out of your build, right? So, for example, if we removed um, this robo, the robo cost 100 gas um, and it's like 150 minerals, I think, nowadays. So usually I just go by the gas count and that would be like two stalkers, right? So just by cutting the robo we're going to have two more stalkers. Now, the downside, obviously, is that we're going to be uh, susceptible to DTs, right? But you can't really think like that if you want to attack. You kind of have to take on some amount of risk because if you don't, well, then again, you just have five stalker versus five stalker. So the, the, uh, the name of the game is to cut as much as you can. Um, and then obviously, you, you, uh, you know, hopefully don't die to DTs, but you accept the risk of dying to DTs so that you can do an attack. And obviously if you like scout a dark shrine, I'm not saying, you know, don't build a robo because you're attacking. <laughs> but if um, if you have no info, you should really be cutting this so you can do the um, the attack, right? So let's say you, you made two robos, you made uh, like plus one in the forge and you made a robo bay. If we cut all this and our opponent has all that tech, we get three stalker from the robo bay, two from each of these robos, and one or two from the uh, plus one upgrade, right? So two, four, six, nine. And then all of a sudden you can see like, okay, wow, this attack is actually going to be strong because my opponent spent all their gas on these tech buildings and I'm going to have um, 14 stalkers to five, right? And then it makes a lot more sense to be doing this attack. Yeah, they have a shield battery, but you got nine more stalkers. So that's the basic of attacking. You want to cut some stuff out of your build and that way you can focus a lot of your resources or even all of your resources on the attack. Okay, now I want to show you guys a game I played against Steadfast. So let me load this up. And while we go through the other game, I want to talk about another concept of attacking. So it's true that we can cut stuff to get really strong attacks. However, if our opponent's a good player and we're in an even position, it shouldn't really matter um, what we cut because they can see that we're attacking and they can also cut some other tech. So for example, in that PVP I just showed you, the Protoss had like a Robo Bay and double Robo, but a strong Protoss would do something like get the Forge with plus one and then not get any more attack and just have that one single small advantage of the upgrade lead and not invest into all that other stuff. And then it's much easier to use the defender's advantage to hold on. Um, so based on that, when you're attacking, you kind of want to have a lead if you want it to be successful a high percentage of the time, right? You don't want to be attacking just because you want to attack, um, unless you're just going to accept that if your opponent plays well, they're going to defend. So what I usually do against top GMs is I don't attack them unless I'm in a good position, right? So, um, in this game, for example, we have some early adept pressure and some oracle pressure and so if this doesn't do well 
then I can um, play into a macro game. So it's a very standard macro game. I'll start playing from here. And we can see that, okay, my adept is scouting. We see that it's a macro game. Steadfast is making a ton of drones. This game goes pretty well for me, by the way, but Steadfast is actually a pretty strong player. So uh, don't judge him by this game. <laughs> All right, so Oracle comes in, and I think he defends this one super well, right? So in this current situation, I'm not really thinking about attacking yet, right? Does absolutely nothing. So there's no way we can attack here. Instead, I'm just kind of developing my economy like normal, right? We're getting the third. We've got some Oracles in production. We got the gates. But in my mind, I'm not really thinking about attacking yet. Okay, now here is where we start to get some damage. So these oracles fly in, and I don't know what happened here. I guess he forgot to move his queens over or whatever, but here is where we really start to rack up some drone kills. Um, now, the amount of drones you want to kill before you attack is kind of going to depend on your league, right? Like, if you're in gold league, you can probably just execute this build no matter what because your opponents are not um, the best at macroing yet. And so you're always going to have an advantage um, going into the attacks. But if you're at my MMR, you kind of need to get some damage like this. And so now we've got 10 Oracle kills, which is honestly astronomical. And so at this point, I'm not going to go into like carrier five base because in my mind, um, I'm already so far ahead that the game is over. So all I need to do is execute a really clean attack here. And then we're going to win. Now on top of that, the Oracle harass this um ling attack also is putting him in quite a bad position because you can think about these lings as not drones right so that was like 16 lings which is like eight drones that he doesn't have anymore. so if we look at the eco we're like ahead in workers against zerg which is really bad for them although steadfast is droning pretty pretty handily here so it doesn't maybe look that bad but considering the damage he's in a, a really terrible position Okay, so the rest of this game is going to be me showing you this setup and um, kind of the corners we're cutting to do this attack. So, I mean, like I said, he's really behind. So there's no way he's going to hold this. So we're not going to focus on that, but just the setup. All right, so I'm adding a forge and a twilight. And you could even cut the forge, but generally in PvZ, I think the forge is pretty good because you can put one cannon here and then you kind of defend counterattacks. So we're not going to cut the forge. But what we are going to cut is a lot of the um, kind of late game tech. So generally in mid game PVZ, you might do something like go for a Templar Archives for Storm. You might make some uh, Immortals from a Robo. You might make like a Robo Bay. You might go Carriers eventually. And so we're going to cut all of that out. We're going to really lean down our um, tech as much as possible. So I'm going to get plus one and I'm going to get blink. But that's actually where my tech stops, right? And I think for a lot of people, that's going to be really uncomfortable because you want to get all these different things like, okay, but I want to put like Dark Templars in my attack and I want to get like Charge as well as Blink. And it seems good because you're getting all these like different attacking upgrades, but it's much better to lean out your attack so that it's really, really focused, right? And so our attack in this game is Blink Stalkers. That's it. Just Blink Stalkers, right? Because again, if we had like charge here, boom, you, you just lost two stalkers, right? Um, Robo, you just lost another two stalkers, right? Robo Bay, three stalkers. And if you add all those things um, and then you try to attack, you're going to have like five stalkers instead of uh, ten. So you're losing like half your army, basically. <laughs> it's a lot harsher than it seems, right? So instead of doing that, we added a lot of gates. I should point out that I added these gates before I started making units as much as possible. That really helps with spending your money. So make sure you do that as well. And the last kind of thing you need to know about attacking is you can't attack someone who is also attacking you, right? And so you'll notice I'm kind of playing a little bit um, passive here, right? And you might be wondering, like, why am I playing so passive? We just said we're going to uh, do this massive attack, right? Why didn't I move out with, like, four stalkers? And the reason I didn't do that is because it kind of looks like he's the one setting up to attack me, right? Like, I, I just had a peek with my oracles over here. 
and there was no drones and there was a lot of zerglings so i'm actually playing quite cautious here and just making sure that there's not like you know 50 roaches on the way now that we realize he's just like that far behind i'm gonna start moving out with the stalkers and i'm not even going to invest in plus two like that's how much we want to lean out attacks because the attack hits at plus one if we go to plus two we lose three stalkers um and it doesn't ever come into play when um it actually matters right like the game is won or lost right here not two minutes from now when plus two finishes so there's some micro involved here but essentially it's more about the um, the setup in my opinion like if you're gonna be winning games it's not gonna be because your micro is bad unless you're like move commanding your army and then close your eyes but apart from that uh, as long as you have a good setup you should be winning your games So we can see he tries to defend here, but losing that many drones in GM is like a death sentence. You could even uh, GG earlier <laughs> because it's just unplayable, honestly. There's just no amount of skill that Steadfast can, um, can use here to win this game. Even if he was like dark, I would have won this game from the opening uh, 8 drone kills. It's just impossible. So anyways, hopefully you guys liked this uh, video, just how to attack. How to get better at attacking try cutting a lot of your tech and see if that allows you to do some more powerful attacks and with that i think we are done this video so thanks for watching make sure to subscribe if you like content like this and we do have a youtube member program so if you click the join button beside the subscribe button you're going to get access to some replay packs if you're in tier one uh tier two we do group practice and then tier three i'm doing unlimited replay analysis so if you drop your replays in the, the chat channel on Discord, I just go through them, write some analysis for you, bam, send them out. Easy coaching, quick. And uh, yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Sign up for the tiers if you want to support the channel. And I will see you guys in the next one. Hey guys, Hu Shang here. Welcome to my interactive series where we're going to be watching a game I've played. And... We're going to be going through it sort of as if you guys were playing the game. And at certain key periods, I'm going to pause the game, ask you guys what we think our opponent is doing, and uh, maybe also ask you guys what kind of reaction we should um, begin. Okay, so our probe arrives. I'll pause it here, and you guys should know whether or not there's something that um, is important here or not. Like, did we scout something yet? Or not and this is a pylon scout so already this isn't really any info because the drone would be coming down if it was a hatch first so we haven't quite picked up on anything yet but at this point it's a little bit suspicious there's no drone coming even checking that we are blocking or not sometimes they'll come down here and see that your probes here and then they can run to the third base but in this case there wasn't even a drone checking so we know that he's going for an earlier pool but there's a lot of options actually there's a 12 pool there's like a 14 pool with or without the gas and there's also some later pools that are like kind of macro but not really like a 16 or 17 pool let's see if we can get any other info Okay, right here we've actually picked up some nice info already about which pool it is. So, let me give you three options. Do you think it's a 12 pool? Do you think it's a uh, 14 pool? Or do you think it's a 16 pool? I know it seems like there's no info here. I'm not counting the drones, if any of you <laughs> think I'm that try hard at counting every single one of these. No way. There's uh, some easier info here that um, I'm picking up on. And that is the eggs. So I see triple egg in production, and if you think about it logically, it doesn't really make sense for a Zerg to be making um, three drones at the same time, because that would slow down their production. So the only thing it can really be here is um, some Zerglings. So we already know the pool is complete without even seeing it, and so therefore this is a 12 pool. But we can just confirm that the pool is over here and finished as well. I'm also picking up on no gas here. No gas is pretty instructive. 
if he had a gas, what would that mean? Is he more or less likely to be aggressive here? If he has a gas. Less likely, right? Because if he's if he's not taking this gas, he can't really be getting any Zergling speed or a Baneling nest right away. And so he's going to be making a couple Zerglings for pressure, but then he's going to be expanding. So at this point, we know he's 12 pulling. We know he's going for some early aggression. And I'm going to be going through my uh, 12 pull reaction. If you don't know what that is, I have a full video on it, like really in depth, like 30 minutes with a bunch of examples and uh, <laughs> super ironed out details. I'll link that um, above, I guess. And uh, you guys can check that out if you struggle versus this build. But basically, we are going to Chrono Boost a couple of Zealots with a two gate setup. And then we're going to um, leave the probe here to prevent him from coming in. Let me just lower the sound a little bit. Okay. So you can see he's doing a very good job here of um, pressuring my Cyber Core on the right. And then he's leaving a couple Zerglings over here in case I try to run out too far and he can trap me. So it's, a, it's definitely a micro battle here. Here I actually let this Zelda get caught on purpose, um, but it was a little bit early. And the reason I did that is because the second Zelda was finishing. So sometimes you can kind of bait them into uh, going after your Zealot and then kill a bunch of Zergling. So that was an on purpose tactic, but it didn't play out. It's not the end of the world though. We're trading very well against these Zerglings. And here I actually had a moment to um, save the, the second Zealot anyways. And now we're going into uh, some Adepts. Expanding. Normal stuff, basically. You can see we're at a, a little bit of a worker advantage. And we're also going to have this counterattack with these Adepts. Now, at this point, I was going to play this very safe, this game. Sometimes what I'll do is just run these straight across. And uh, you could probably do that here. But um, one of my own personal flaws is just getting a little bit too aggressive a lot of the time. So... This game in particular, I was actually trying to play over safe so I don't throw. Because that's one of my main things, is just, you know, getting ahead early game against strong players and then, you know, making things too precise where I mess up. And so, yeah, we're just playing super, super safe here. Getting the Stalker first, getting some shields on the Zealot, and then going for the counterattack. But okay, so the Adept comes through, and we're obviously playing for some kills here. Recall to get out. There's kind of some info here, but um, it's it's pretty normal to see this where there's not too many worker yet. So there's not really any indication um, right now that he's doing an all-in. So we go home. And yeah, we can kind of just macro up from this position. There's nothing to, uh, to look for um, at this moment. So I'm going to be going for a really standard Stargate follow-up. And we're going to be over and taking our third base. I think for some people this might feel like it's quite greedy, um, but it's actually very, very safe as long as you have good setup. So like make sure your unit's in the wall, obviously, make sure you have a nice wall. And then um, since we're going for an Oracle, if he goes for like Zergling attack, then we'll have, um, we'll be able to use that against the um, attack and be fine. And it's worth pointing out too that you don't need to be afraid of something like a Roach push, because if you remember earlier, we saw that he had no gas. And so it's not really possible for him to have that much money to do that. At least not a very, uh, I mean, if, right as we left, if he took a gas, he could make like a couple roaches, you know, like, like five roaches or something, but it's not scary. It's just not a good, uh, a good build. Okay. So we get the Oracle. We've got this nice little pylon Nexus wall. That's actually really critical. If you don't do that, then you're very susceptible to Zergling, uh, pushes. So make sure you have this um, set up here. And our Oracle is going to get some more info at this point. Okay, so notice my movement, right? Like, what am I looking for here? Normally, I think people might just run straight for the natural and kill a bunch of workers. And that, I mean, that's what most pro gamers are doing. But they're also doing something else while they do that. And I think most people sub-GM should be not focusing on killing workers. They should be focused on... Um, getting info about what the opponent is doing. So what am I looking for here? I just went this way. So I'm looking for a, um, a hatchery, right? To see if he's expanded. And that's not the only location for a hatchery. So you're going to see me um, check for the other side as well. So 
we check some drones and then we check this base okay so we see no third base right so what's going on should we have seen a third base here um, is it normal to not have a third base which builds are are likely coming up now so if our opponent was doing like a normal macro build we definitely should have seen a third here now he did open 12 pool but you know um, that doesn't delay your third this much right like if you're playing 12 pool and we're in a macro game you can see that I've already have my third so he should definitely have his if he's trying to you know drone up and um, just play like a very standard game so he's doing something right he's doing some sort of uh, tech or all in I guess so at this point we want to start looking for what exactly he's doing um, which tech he's going for so I'm gonna take my oracles and we're just gonna run through his base Notice that even at this MMR, I really don't care about harassing him too much. Like, we could kill some drones here, maybe, but it's more important to figure out what he's doing. Okay, so we see um, some clues here. There's two clues. One of the clues is the Evo Chamber, and one of the clues is the Lair. So, he could be going, like, Roaches here. He could be going Hydras, I suppose. Um, but when I see this, I'm thinking he's probably going for like um, Well, actually, let's let's keep playing. There's there's another clue that I'm picking up on here in a second Over on this side that tells me uh, what I think he's doing So I go through his base we see an Evo and a layer and I see one gas so maybe you guys can take a second and uh, and think about what he's probably doing here So low gas, so he's probably not going like Mutalisk, let's say, right? Because if you're going to go Mutalisk, you would probably go fast layer, no Evo, and then you would take a lot of gas. Like you would have these three already. Same thing if you wanted to do like a really fast Roach build. So to me, this screams out that he's just going for um, like a Ling speed upgrade, because that's the only thing that you can really make if you have this many minerals. We meet our fate. Also, we're going to see his third base. So now we know that he's probably going for Zerglings and he's taking a third base so he's probably not all linning us and so I can already kind of anticipate what's coming so yeah so he's probably going to be doing some big Zergling attack on our third right is what's most likely let's fast forward this period a little bit I'm just going to be doing like a very basic setup with um, a bunch of gates There's another key moment coming up though. So we're clearing some creep. We're looking around. He's got a couple queens here. That's pretty normal. But these oracles are going to rotate in here and they're going to pick up some uh, really nice info at his third base. So maybe think about right now what you would expect to see here if he was playing a normal macro game. And let's keep playing. Okay, so I come in here, there's a spore going down, which makes sense, we're playing oracles, but is this different from what you expected to see? For me, it's like uh, an oh fuck moment. <laughs> like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? This is uh, the opposite of what I expected to see, because there's literally no drones. So I'm going to just tag this, and that's going to give me a little more info, like maybe there was a drone transfer right maybe there's like 20 drones coming here but um we don't see any drones right and um our early game went pretty well but it didn't go this well you know we didn't send the adepts across and kill like 12 drones so at this point you guys should know what he's up to and you're gonna see me make some hard reactions here so what do you think he's going for it's cats so uh it's bound to be a little crazy and don't forget, we saw some stuff over here as well. Like, we saw the um, the Evo and the Lair. So, we know what he got the Evo for. But what did he get the Lair for? Alright. So, you probably didn't guess this because it's off the walls batshit crazy. But, um... <laughs> he's going for, like, a Queenling attack. Right? He's getting the Lair for the, um... 
for the dropper lord uh speed and being able to pick them up and he's going for the evo for the ling upgrade so what am i doing back here let's go back a sec just so you guys can see the production tab at this point so this is slightly before we scouted it here's where we scout him and you'll notice like right here i'm going to cut probes and i'm going to focus more on building units so right at that point i'm like okay we gotta start reacting to this let's warp in some units immediately and just prioritize those and then we can also maybe add some extra defense right like normally i would not get any of this stuff i would probably be going for a fourth actually really fast but since he has no workers we can really react hard to this info throw down a lot of cannon you know let's prioritize the units not be making workers that kind of thing okay let's go back to my vision with the production tab and let's see how this plays out you can also see him kind of confirming some info here right so i flew over here there's no fourth base. That's really confirming for me that he's crazy all in. A little bit of splitting micro. And we can see his queens pop out. And because we knew what he was doing, this is a really easy hold. And now our position is just completely winning all of a sudden. And if you remember earlier, I said that um, one of my goals this game was to play incredibly safe. So the normal thing I would do in this position is just go counterattack, um, and that's probably good, honestly. But just to make sure we don't lose, like have a hundred percent chance of winning, I'm going to play this really slow. So I'm just going to take a fourth base and continue massing units, and then with my oracles, I'm going to be looking for some more info. So here we get some info. We see a fourth. So what do you guys think he's doing here, like? Should we definitely attack him now, or, um, you know, how do we how do we know how, what level he's um, macroing at? Should we base this on the hatcheries, or should we base it on something else that Zerg produces? For me, this hatchery is, like, kind of in indicative that he's macroing, but it's not, it's not a very uh, strong sign, because if Zerg wants to continue all letting you here, they can easily throw down a hatch and then just keep making units. So for me, what I want to see is more drones. No base over here. So we haven't seen any more drones. And we've also... I mean, we've seen the hatch, but we just killed it. So he's, like, really um, still quite aggressive. You can even see here, like, he doesn't have the gases. And so, um, yeah, he doesn't have a very high drone count relative to us. Maybe take a guess how many drones you think he has right now. I guess I could take a guess, too. Um, I think he's on, like... Well, actually, I wonder if it counts the ones he's making. Let me guess the ones he doesn't have. Like, currently, currently mining. I'm thinking he has, like, 50. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I think he's got, like, two gases here. So what would that be? 32, 38, 16, 56? Let's see what he actually has. So he's got... I'm going to minus the ones in production, I think. So whatever he has here, minus 7. 52. Okay, that's pretty close. 52 so he's got a very very low drone count and so because of that we can play this very passive and it's totally fine it's ultra safe but it's totally fine okay still trying to pick up some info we see that he's making some units too so he's obviously very scared of our uh, counter attack and this kind of puts him on a clock because now his economy is so bad that he basically has to all in us in my opinion so we can just chill here there's no pressure to attack him. I'm just going to continue building like a pretty basic comp too. Like you see me getting a Robo Bay at the natural for Disruptor since he's making Roach. But, you know, I'm not going Carrier here. I'm not going for like a ton of tech. I'm basically just building more of what we already have because there's no real reason. Um, like we're not forced to teching up. And this is a much safer way of playing it because we have the maximum amount of units. Um, and so it's much harder to throw the game. He's also still, he still has no fourth. So I'm still just playing very patient. Again, this isn't necessary, but it's one of my weaknesses. So I think it's a, I think it's a good thing to do. 
Let me fast forward a little bit here. Actually, let's look at this part. I thought there was no more questions I want to ask you guys, but this is um, a good thing to look at. So I was worried about one thing right now before I did this scout that I'm not worried about after. So if you just imagine what we've seen him produce here, he hasn't really made a lot of gas units. So there's one unit in particular that I was thinking he might go for that we could um, we could lose to, potentially. So for me, that was the Mutalisk. I'm thinking, okay, it might be going Mutas here just because we haven't really seen any Ravagers. We've only seen like a couple Roach. Um, and he could have taken all these gases when we weren't looking. So I'm running the uh, Hallucinated Phoenix through here. Make sure you pay attention to the movement of the buildings too because that tells you a lot. Right here especially, I'm seeing something that tells me a lot of info. So what kind of composition do you guys think he's going for? For me, it's pretty clear right now that he's going for like a Hydra Ling Bane. He's got the Hydra uh, Den. I mean, he's been making Ling upgrades before. And we also see a Bane Nest that's wiggling, so he's getting the Bane speed. So he's basically going for like Hydra Ling Bane. Alright, at this point we're maxed out, so I think I'm going to pull the trigger uh, soon, if not already. And we're going to go for a big attack on his... Uh, fourth base here that we scout. Here we go. And I mean, if you look at the supplies, it's uh, insane how far ahead we are against a Zerg player. So this should be pretty much game over. We don't really need to do anything crazy in this engagement. Just uh, don't run like all our zealots into the banes, basically. You can see here, he's playing this pretty uh, intelligently in his position. Like, he's kind of screwed, but at the same time, he's uh, trying to maximize his um, comeback potential here. But yeah, you can see here, he just, he really doesn't have enough units. Um, we haven't even warped in during this battle. So it's, it's not really even as close as it looks here. We've got 2,000, 2,000 in the bank. All we really needed to do here was like kill this base and we would still be winning. But um, yeah, with such a big lead, we can we can pretty much end the game. And I think that's pretty much it. Maybe you guys want to watch the final battle, but I uh, hope you like this video. If you got some, uh, some questions in the comments, feel free to uh, shoot me those. And if you want some coaching, check out my website, huishangcoaching.com. And as always, we would love to see you guys in the Discord. So yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed the last battle, and I will see you in the next one. Hey guys, Hu Shang here. We're gonna be doing something a little bit cool today, a little bit new. I'm gonna be going through a game that I played on ladder and what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna kinda stop the game at certain points and test you guys on your game knowledge. See if you guys, you know, are picking up on the, the same scouting things that I am picking up on. So, my plan this game is to go into a Stargate and yeah so we're probably going to open up like adept stargate warp gate although if you guys don't play stargate this is still going to be uh helpful for sure so i'm doing a gateway scout you guys should all be doing a uh, gateway scout or if you're not going to scout on gate you should do like a pylon scout those will both keep you safe. If you do anything later than that, it's a little bit um, sketchy. So obviously nothing weird here yet. I'm going to do two guys on gas since we're playing uh, Stargate. So it's a bit, uh, a bit more gas heavy. And when a probe gets here, you basically just want to make sure they have a Rax 
pretty obvious, but, uh, you know, sometimes you're not paying attention. You can also look at the, the racks timing, because there are some builds where you get a later racks because you proxied your first one, so <laughs> you got to be on the lookout for that. But okay, so this looks pretty standard, so I'm going to actually just pause here, right? So we see one racks, and we see one gas, and this is pretty much what a standard setup would look like. So there's only one more thing we need to double check after this to determine whether it is um, a macro build. So yeah, maybe take like five seconds, think about what that would be. If you don't know, don't worry, we'll uh, be looking for that in a second. And that thing is the command center. So at this point here, we're gonna leave his base and we're gonna click on this because um, normally you would make a unit. So he's got a tech lab. All right, so we see a tech lab. We're going to check for the command center, but what does the tech lab uh, mean? So if you see a tech lab, you should be thinking marauders. There's not really anything else that they could be getting. Um, I guess in theory, they could make a ghost, but um, probably not a ghost rush here with one gas. Probably marauders, like 100% marauders. Okay, and we're looking for the command center. So you should know what time the command center is supposed to go down. So should it be down already? Should it be at like 2.30? You should know that. It should be down like right now. So at this point, I am a little bit suspicious, but he could have just made it on the high ground. So I come up here again. Still no command center, still no gas. All right, so at this point in the game, you should know what's going on. You should actually know what the opponent's doing. You have all the info to know what's going on. Um, except for this map's a bit funny. So there, there's like two possibilities, but on most maps, there's really only, uh, one. Okay. So what are those two possibilities? So one possibility is that he's going for, um, Marauders here. Well, actually he's going to be going Marauders regardless, but one possibility is he's going Marauders here and he's got some barracks proxied on the map. And the second uh, possibility is that he's going for like a proxy base. And that would be particularly good on this map because there's a gold. On other maps though, it'd be pretty bad to like if you proxy over here with um, actually this, this is high gas. I didn't realize that. But any base that has, um, you know, like just minerals and gas like normal is probably not very good um, because Protoss can just go over there and uh, kill it. So at this point, I'm thinking the most likely option is um, the proxy uh, barracks, like uh, maybe three barracks all in. And so what would be your response to that? And um, to clarify, I'm going to specifically be responding to that because if it's a proxy command center, again, we can just go over there and kill it. So that's not really the, uh, you know, the threat that's not going to end the game. It's much more important to just assume that he's doing the aggressive build. And then if he's not, if you figure it out, you can just like ease back up. Okay. So what is our response against the, um, the all-in version. So the main mistake I see commonly is thinking that you need to get production here. And whenever you're getting all-in, you usually don't add production, or at least you don't add a lot of production because if you invest all your money in the production, you're not going to have um, any units by the time they attack you. So we're going to be chronoing stalkers and we're going to be adding uh, a shield battery. I just had uh, to fix my hotkeys there. Also, since we knew he was all enemy, I wanted to make sure we had the right hotkeys because uh, <laughs> things are going to get heated quickly. And all right, I'm doing uh, one extra thing that I forgot to mention. I'm also looking for the proxy, just trying to figure out where it is. Um, just in case, I mean, it, it, again, it could be a CC here. It's not very good, but in theory, it could be there. So I'm going to check for that in a second. And I kind of just want to know where the proxy is as well. Because if I know where it is, then I can kind of, you know, angle my units a bit better. But okay, so we chrono a stalker. We're going to chrono the next stalker as well once we figure it out. And the best tech choice. That's a good question. What tech choice should we get here? Should we go Stargate? Um, like our plan was or is it better to go for let's say like a robo or a twilight or should we just add like more gates? A lot of options honestly 
and I think a couple of them could be fine. Like you probably won't lose with all of them, but there's definitely one that you're gonna or two that you're gonna get uh, you know owned with. <laughs> so um, for example, if you go for a Stargate here, you're gonna really struggle, I think, um, unless you're gonna be making um, adepts with it. So currently I'm making stalkers. So if you go like Stargate plus stalkers, you're not really gonna be able to afford both. Um, and I think the Stargate doesn't really help you against a lot of you know ground all ins because it takes so long to get the Stargate finished and to get the um, you know like Void Ray finished, which would be the best. Also, kind of same thing if you go Twilight, like it's not really helping you get units, so not a very good tech choice to go Twilight. Uh, Robo could be okay. I usually go Robo against all ins, um, but in this case, I think it's actually a little bit stronger to just go for um, Stalkers and Gateway. But definitely don't go Twilight or Stargate. So you can see, um, I think I started with Robo here. And we're getting uh, three Stalkers. And we didn't see any proxy. So I'm kind of confused here actually. Because if, if you want to do an all-in from Terran here, you should probably try and do it pretty quickly. So it would make the most sense to put like two barracks here. So that you can get the attack going quickly. And yeah, if you like proxy it really far, but Protoss kind of knows you're all in anyways then it's not gonna work so yeah I think he should have put them here but instead he hid them uh, somewhere on the map I actually didn't check the replay but okay so now now it's pretty obvious <laughs> which one he's doing he's not transferring these uh, these boys over here for uh, faster mining that's definitely not happening <laughs> so uh, now the plan is just to you know spend all of our money only on um, defense so i'm adding some shield batteries i'm obviously continuing to chrono boost the stalkers and i canceled the robo just because um i thought it would probably be better to get the gate instead it's not like we're gonna have the immortal done in time anyways and then one additional thing i did is i just hotkeyed all the probes up here because what i want to do is just pull them all the way down once i see his attack is starting so right here i pull all the probes and I overcharge immediately just so that um, it buys us some time. I probably could have like stood here and blocked them a bit better as well. Obviously he has to go for the overcharge, but we have a couple more shield batteries, so we're able to out DPS him. Pulling the probes here though is really, really important because he has all of his workers as well. So he's basically uh, all in. Like if this doesn't work, we win. So he GG's right away. And yeah, hopefully you guys did good on the little uh, pop quizzes. If you have any other questions, just leave them in the comments and uh, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. So thanks for watching. If you want any one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out my website, hushangcoaching.com. There'll be a link in the comments and the video description as well. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. I will see you in the next one. Peace. Come on, Hellion, catch up. I want to go in. Oh man, Kerfuffle with the well-timed build order. Even on Waterfall, the absolute shortest rush distance, like, I couldn't do shit there. <laughs> that's actually, that's quite impressive, to be honest. Yo, what's up, guys? Hugh Shang here. I have a pretty sick replay for you guys. I know a lot of my students, at least for sure, have been struggling against this double gas opening from Terran and specifically the kind of reaper hellion attack terrans a little bit ago kind of figured out that they can just do tvt builds in this matchup as well and um, i think a lot of protoss have really been struggling against this maybe not at the pro level but uh at least i've been getting owned by this quite often and when i was looking through the dreamhack atlanta replays a lot of people were getting owned there as well so i'm going to show you what i have figured out here it's kind of like a puzzle figuring out these new builds and I've completed the puzzle. I have the perfect defense. I, it's literally the perfect defense, guys. You take zero damage.
So we're going to go through this. How to defend the double gas Reaper Hellion. Okay. Shut the fuck up, Hu Shang. Stop talking. Sh show, me the, show me the build. Okay, let's get through it. So we've got a standard uh, set up here. 16 gas. Or sorry. Jeez. 16 uh, gateway. 16 gas. It's uh, pretty late here. <laughs> so I guess my brain's not working 100%. <clears throat> but okay, 16 gate, 16 gas, probe scout on 16 as well. And then we're going to be chrono boosting a bunch of probes. I am mining quite a bit of gas here, but that's because I'm going to be opening Stargate. You actually don't have to open up Stargate if you don't want to. Any tech choice is going to be fine here. That's not really the crux of the defense. Then we're going to grab a cyber core on 21. In the meantime, we're going to scout them, see that they fully walled off. And they're up to shenanigans. But this pretty much means either double gas or there's like one more build they can do, which is like a Dolan proxy three racks. So if you want to go around and scout for this, you can, I guess. Um, but basically that build goes marine first. They don't take any uh, gas and they like proxy four racks you basically. But other than that, it should be the Reaper build. So you can already start doing this response. And we're going to basically go uh, pylon on 21 as well. 21 gas. On other maps, you can go 21 gas first and still get the Adept out in time for the Reaper, but this map's super ultra short, so you actually need to go for the Pylon first. I would just go Pylon first if you're like Submasters. Then you're going to be Chrono Boosting your Adept. And I'm going to be grabbing my Stargate next before Warp Gate, but if you're going like Twilight Opening or Robo Opening, anything like that, you can go for a Warp Gate as well and then go for your Twilight or Robo a little bit later. So the important thing is that we chrono boost this first unit and we also chrono boost the second unit. If you don't chrono boost again, you're not going to have three units in time for their uh, early attack. And the other thing that's really important for this is that you start a shield battery in your main. You actually don't want it at your natural. I watched Pilly Pilly play against Beyond and Pilly Pilly put it at the natural because I think on NA... Um, the Terrans aren't quite as strong as Beyond, obviously. And if the Terran pushes your natural, it's it's actually quite good to have the shield battery here. But the problem is that if your units are over here, they can't also be in your main. And so you're really well defended over here with the shield battery, but you're literally naked in your main base. Whereas if you put the shield battery in the main, your units can stay down here to defend. And three units is more than enough to defend whatever push they're doing. So this keeps you way more safe. So I'm going to drop the shield battery up here. This is pretty delayed compared to when I usually get it. I actually usually drop this like as the tech structure goes down. So this could definitely be a bit faster, but this is still a pretty safe timing to get it. And then we're going to go for a third unit. And like I said, you have to chrono boost to get all three units out in time for their push. So one more chrono. This does mean you can't chrono boost your Stargate as much, but that's totally fine because... We have a really massive probe lead relative to normal games because um, they've invested so much in their early attack. So three units on the way. We've got the Oracle as well. I will say that the Oracle opening is like even more of a massive shutdown than like a Twilight because the Oracle can also go after the Reaper Hellion. So in this situation, it's like completely devastating. But if you go Twilight, you're going to do probably... Um, better against like what am I drop maybe that's not even true um but you won't have the oracle to kill the reaper hellion um so it's just a little bit of a different tech choice this game I went oracle I do also defend this with um twilight and robo and like phoenix openings so you can kind of do those as well but as you can see here the three adept is easily enough to kill all these units and this is so committed of a push from the terran that not doing any damage is basically gg like we're up eight workers at this point. Zero damage was done. We can take a third base. We can start tacking. And Terran is just like just taking their natural with <laughs> no orbital. So if we keep this game going for, um, you know, like the next minute, we're going to have an additional pro building over the Terran. And yeah, we're going to just have like an unstoppable position. So hopefully you guys enjoyed um, this little mini guide. If you did, make sure to subscribe, 
follow for more content. And if you want some additional coaching, feel free to reach out to me on Discord or check out my website, hushangcoaching.com. All right. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the next one. Hey guys, Hu Shang here. Welcome to another StarCraft 2 lesson. Today we're going to be checking out some games from the DreamHack Atlanta replay pack, which uh, ESL has dropped recently. Um, also, if you guys want to download this, you can come over to my uh, announcements in Squad Shang. And uh, the link is here for you guys to, um, to download these replays for yourself. But today I have... Some pretty sweet games for you guys. I've been trying to do this lesson format for a while where we go through like different levels of a specific defense. And I found one guy in this tournament, the infamous Poppy Joe, who basically does this build every single game. <laughs> and the build that we're going to be looking at is a proxy robo. So I've got four different levels. We've got two games against Riser. They actually played uh, a ton of games. So Poppy Joe. Proxy robot him twice. And then we've got a game against Shadown and a game against Creator. So Creator obviously going to be uh, the highest level here. Okay. So this is their first encounter. I think this is the first game they played out of their series. And like I said, Poppy Joe is just a uh, proxy robo aficionado. I played him on ladder and he does this almost all the time. <laughs> so... We're going to check out uh, this proxy, proxy robo defense here from Riser. Um, but this is their first meeting. So he has no idea, I don't think, about what Poppy Joe uh, tends to do. But as you can see here, we're placing our second pylon kind of out on the map. It's kind of a weird proxy, if we can even call it that. Because obviously proxy is supposed to be proximity to the opponent. Um, but here we are on Poppy Joe's side of the map. <laughs> it's like barely closer than his main base. Um, but the benefit, of course, is that uh, Riser doesn't know, you know, what sort of tech it is. If you place it in the main at this time, then Riser can see it and make some, you know, finer tuned adjustments. So the problem here is that um, Riser might suspect it could be Stargate or it could be, you know, DTs. And then, of course, it can also be the proxy robo so he's looking around for it let's go to his vision actually so we can see um, how he goes about defending this we can also see he's proxy to pylon uh, in the top I'm not exactly sure what the idea was here maybe for uh, adepts though later on or just to hide a pylon I guess is possible as well but he comes up here he sees some stalkers and that's kind of all he sees so he sends the hallucinated phoenix he's opening up with like a pretty safe triple stalker sentry build and we're gonna see him drop a shield battery and the, the reason he's dropping the shield battery again is because proxy stargate is completely viable here it definitely could have been that now he's seen the robo with the phoenix immediate cancel right we don't need that anymore it's not a proxy stargate and so we're gonna focus all of our defense here on the front and yeah, so the way Riser is chosen to try and defend this is by going for three gateways. So I haven't seen this defense before. I feel like this is a little bit um, weak, I guess, because you're kind of banking on the extra economy at the natural. And eventually you're going to have a much weaker army. So I'm not exactly sure what the idea is here. But um, he's going for this gateway defense. He's making a lot of sentry, a lot of stalker. And he's got a lot of initial um, power here with all these shield batteries. So Poppy Joe doesn't really push the front. Instead, he's kind of abusing this War Prism mobility, right? Coming into the main, threatening to take down that pylon that's powering all of Riser's production. And this is kind of one of the, um, the weaknesses of, you know, placing your gateways over here, right? Of course, it's standard, but... It's actually difficult to um, to run back and forth and, and uh, defend this location. So Poppy Joe's kind of abusing that. 
But on the other hand, we do have a pretty... Um, we have more economy. We have seven probes in a natural here that Poppy Joe doesn't have because he's still on one base. So we do have extra money. And okay, so that pylon over there, we actually just saw him warp in some adepts. So that was the idea with that pylon. I guess it was so far in the north just so it doesn't get picked off, which makes a lot of sense. Another stalker going down. So, I mean, Poppy Joe's getting a lot of value with these immortals. I think he's picked off like three stalkers already. Now, we do have these adepts coming in. So, if these could go in and do some damage, we can maybe uh, start to push this back. But the problem is that Poppy Joe is uh, an aficionado and uh, those adepts didn't get in. I think that was a big mistake, actually, just moving away from the, uh, the shield batteries. I think oftentimes what happens, like, even in GM, is you're under pressure for this long and you feel like you're kind of winning because you have the the natural expansion mining and so what you do is you're like okay i can finally break this and relieve the pressure right but oftentimes you kind of want to keep that pressure because if you're the one to break the pressure then it's uh at a disadvantage for you right like he's he's moving out here but he's not using his shield batteries However, I think I think what was also happening is he knew he didn't have any tech buildings. And so he felt like he needed to do something because eventually Poppy Joe is going to have like four immortals. And his army is just disgustingly good. And, you know, no amount of gateway units is going to be able to deal with that at some point. So I think that was also part of the, uh, the reason he's kind of pushing out here. But yeah, at this point, we're going Twilight Council, I think for Blink. But of course, Blink Stalkers as well, not really great against Immortals. So I feel like we kind of got stuck in, um, you know, the high pressure situation here of the tournament. And yeah, the game is starting to get uncomfortable, to say the least. I think another mistake that uh, Riser made here is he's got way too many workers. We're on um, like 16 workers of the natural against a one base opponent. And so our army supply is really hurting because of that. But maybe if he gets blink, he can make some plays. At least he can not get forest field it, I suppose. Also, I think another weakness of this, uh, this gateway setup is that um, Poppy Joe could go disruptors. And personally, I feel like if you go the gateway style and he goes disruptors, you get in a lot of trouble really quick. So that could be a dangerous uh, problem here as well. But yeah, as you can see, like once Poppy Joe got three, four immortals, his army is just kind of untouchable by this gateway man style. And so Poppy Joe is going to break through here. And uh, yeah, there's kind of nothing that we can do. I think we overprobed. I think we kind of chose a poor check tech choice here. And yeah, I mean, this is a tournament. Keep in mind, like... Riser is a really strong player, but this is a tournament, so there's a lot of uh, pressure. You're in like a, a different situation, and so Poppy Joe is going to take him down. But, but, we have a second encounter here. Riser is uh, maybe going to get some redemption now that he knows uh, what's going on. So let me fast forward to the proxy robo setup. Riser's up here in the uh, top left. And of course we have Poppy Joe, <laughs> the proxy immortal fiend in the bottom right. And I should have pointed out last game, by the way, that this pylon is missing pretty early. You need the second pylon to make these first two gateway units. And so that's how um, Riser knows that some sort of proxy is happening. And okay, this game we spot the proxy robo much faster, right? Immediately when you see the there's no second pylon, you can send this probe around. And we find the proxy robo. So what are we going to do? Okay, so this game we're going to choose an immediate stargate. So we went double stalker. And then we went stargate. And then we went two more stalker. And yeah, this response I like a lot more, of course. Because um, we're actually making a tech structure that counters the robo. Sometimes you actually don't need to um, make a building that counters it uh, directly. Like sometimes you can use tactics to overcome that. But yeah, in this in this kind of situation, I think it's better to 
to counter the robo straight up or at least match it so we go four stalker and this game starts off pretty nicely because we're able to pick off the stalker i believe yeah and then we have a robo or sorry a stargate so this this void ray is coming in some nice micro riser as well shooting at the immortal one time there so now the immortal can't really pressure him immediately because there's no barrier and yeah once this void ray pops out it's gonna be a little bit different that void ray carries a lot of power so one of the other differences with this setup is we don't have the uh, natural so it's it's quite a bit different actually because in the last game riser could kind of sit back and um, and wait for Poppy Joe to push into him like Poppy Joe had to push in but this game is different because Riser doesn't have the natural and so there's actually no reason that Poppy Joe has to go and attack immediately instead it's gonna be a much more like even setup like Riser's not gonna die for sure but he also can't really um, you know he's not gonna have a lead by sitting back it's only gonna be even I guess he, he does have a lead in a sense that he's got the upper hand on the tech choice. Like knowing your opponent went Robo and going Void Rays, you do have the upper hand there. But as we can see in the production tab over here, Poppy Joe is going for the Twilight Council, presumably for a blink. And trying to uh, to counter the Void Rays somewhat with that. However, neither player has an expansion. So just much more of like a solid approach like you don't get any advantages but you also don't die and you kind of just progress the game and i was watching this replay earlier and i was wondering maybe it would have been a little bit stronger to go like one void ray potentially into oracles or even just like one oracle and then back into void rays potentially i don't know it felt like this was the right choice when i saw the stargate immediately and then it feels like it's kind of um, losing a lot of its power over time. Like I thought he was going to just crush the um, the robo attack with like two void rays. But we can see it's kind of just evening out. Like okay finally we have three void rays so it's like Poppy Joe can't really fight. But he still kind of can because he's got so many stalkers. Yeah I probably shouldn't have fought into the... Um, the overcharge void rays there but he does have blink almost finished and i think if he didn't even go for blink he would have had more army there and it probably still would have been like a pretty even trade so i don't know if i'm feeling the void rays anymore maybe there's some tweaks we can make to this kind of setup to uh to make it work i don't know He does have high ground vision here and he is starting to make some oracles which I think have like a little bit more utility and are pretty nice. I also think he had a lot of potential um, power in this attack that he didn't quite take advantage of. Like I think he could have killed these uh, gates on the high ground maybe. Um, but maybe he was scared of the blink potentially coming in. Maybe he just wanted to play it safe because this is a pretty uh, <laughs> high stakes tournament I guess. But um Either way, he backs up, takes his expansion, and he's going for Blink himself. And that stasis did pay off, so he's kind of buying some time here. And we'll see how he does this game. I think you got to really be careful not to over probe in these situations. Like, you want to have a bigger economy for sure to take advantage of your Nexus, but you don't want to have so much that it's kind of a liability and you're um, way lower in the unit count. So, there's definitely a balance you want to strike. So, he's fighting out here because he's got the um, the high ground vision. And also because you want to be a little bit careful in Riser's position about the um, potential of the War Prism drop. So, I think it's okay to stay here for a little bit. But I think you do want to kind of pull back your shield batteries and fight there if you can eventually because of course you've got the overcharge and a pretty large defender's advantage same kind of thing this this game though i think riser is overdoing the probes like his natural is literally full 
And if I go to the every, everyone cam real quick, you'll see that Poppy Joe is still on uh, one base. So I don't think you need this much of a lead. I think he's probably going to defend this game. But um, yeah, I think it's just a bit too much of a lead. It makes it really hard to defend when it should be a lot easier, I think. So now we have kind of these War Prism annoying shenanigans, but unlike the last game, we got the Void Rays, so the War Prism has to be incredibly careful here. And we finally have our own Blink. So I think at this time in the game, Riser is actually in like a pretty massive advantage. Like the Immortals aren't really uh, in play anymore. And although the Void Rays are not like amazing, they're, um, they're kind of preventing a lot of... Uh, like crazy shenanigans with the war prism so they're kind of doing their their job okay-ish and we have blink so our army's kind of competing and mainly we have a massive economy way bigger than uh poppy joe's so now he scouts the nexus of poppy joe and like from this position here when you scout the nexus you can immediately start playing a pretty um greedy macro game if you want or you could potentially set up for some sort of counterattack because when your opponent takes their expansion, they're kind of equalizing the resources invested in the economy. So you no longer have to play kind of defensive and overly safe. You can start um, either getting out on the map or you can start expanding and trying to get even more ahead on the uh, eco front. So now that Riser has secured his like really nice lead, he's also going for a Robo, <laughs> which is uh, pretty important actually in PvP. Like whenever you have a good position, you should definitely go for Observers. It is a little bit slow here, um, but I think it's a good thing that he's uh, not rushing that Robo too fast because you can also get under a lot of pressure from the, uh, the all-in. So like as soon as you see your opponent expand in PvP, that's generally when you go for uh, detection here, when you're relieved of that pressure. And usually you would have an Oracle in this position as well, instead of the Robo so fast, because you have the Stargate. So that's naturally a bit uh, of a smoother transition before the Robo. But I think his Oracle got picked off or something. Either way though. And then also, from Poppy Joe's position, we should point out that... Um, Going for the Dark Shrine like that is um, is actually pretty strong if you already have a War Prism. So like if you ever open a Robo and you're just stuck with the War Prism, the DT transition is quite a bit stronger. So you should probably go for that. Obviously this game he's a little bit too behind from the opening, from the Void Ray counterattack, and uh, and Riser is able to uh, to come across the map and just kill him. Could have also taken an expansion, but yeah, I mean, if you're this far ahead, I think the Blink Stalker attack is a bit stronger, and uh, Poppy Joe taps out. So, Poppy Joe did go on to win this series, by the way, but he couldn't play the um, Immortal, Proxy Immortal, all in anymore because, uh, yeah, this defense was a lot cleaner. And for level three, we have a game against Shadown. So, Shadown goes for a much more crazy defense <laughs> way more creative not the defense I would go for for sure but let's see how um, how shutdown goes for it so standard openings slow it down here I'm trying to find the probe I think this is the first time the probe went across and we see a pylon starting, but it's not the correct time for the second pylon. This is more of a third pylon timing. And the reason I know that, you don't need to like memorize the game time. You just need to know that your stalkers have already started. And in order for that to happen, you need a second pylon. So there has to be another pylon out on the map. You can see Shadown's kind of poking around for it here. And we can also see these stalkers moving across the map. He should definitely try and find the pylon I think but um, he's not really going for that surprisingly so he's doing a lot less scouting than um, than riser did
but he is going for this kind of four stalker pressure so he is going to get some info of that and he is going to get a shield better in his main so he is covering all the bases like if this was proxy stargate then he would um have the shield battery in time so he's not gonna um die against that and also he's going for a really fast robo so he's not really under um massive threat from proxy robo either but i feel like this isn't a very ambitious defense it's kind of like uh again it's kind of trying to get like into an even position in the mid game you're not really playing for too much of uh an advantage also, he's making like a ton of workers, which is interesting. I wonder what he's going to do with those extra workers. Because you're not really gaining any extra money after about um, 24 or so. And even those ones aren't mining super efficiently. So he's just defending here. He went for a war prism first. Um, so he's going to be down in a mortal. But the idea is he gets a little bit of counter pressure. You don't want to like just make immortals here for sure because then you get stuck in your main base with no counterplay and your opponent can just take an expansion um and then even though you have like a similarly good army you can't really go down the ramp it's just too advantageous for the opponent so instead of playing like that kind of poor setup he's gonna go for the war prism counter attack which makes a lot of sense Unfortunately, he's got to give up that gateway. There's no way he can really um, contest this army too much. He's just kind of trying to uh, buy time for the war prison to get some counter damage in. So it does okay. Poppy Joe is definitely ready for that. And here, I think, is where we start to see Shadown's crazy plan uh, come into play. <laughs> Going for a proxy nexus. I've never tried this actually, but I feel like this is um, fairly strong if your opponent isn't uh, aware that this is a plan. So he, he kind of makes Poppy Joe feel like he's winning. And you could tell that this was Shadown's plan the whole time because he made all those extra probes, which he wouldn't normally make. So he's really banking on the fact that, um, that Poppy Joe doesn't find this, I, I think. But even if he does find it, you can always... Uh, you know, come down to the low ground once he goes to kill it, and then you've kind of solved the problem of being in st stuck in your base. So I feel like this plan actually has a lot of potential. Could be good. This war prism is also super annoying. I think Pappy Joe actually went all the way back to uh, his base, so Shadown is able to come down onto the low ground. And very importantly, if you're going to play a plan like this, oh, he's trying to push the war prism away here. <laughs> very smart. Um, so what I was going to say is, um, it's very important with a plan like this that you actually take another base because if you don't take this natural expansion, your opponent's going to know immediately that, um, that you're going for some sort of hidden base. So really important to take a third base as well. And then you can always just give it up if you have to, but you want to just pretend you're taking your, your base really slowly here. So now we have a pretty massive advantage, I believe. Poppy Joe is still all in here. So again, we don't need to defend the natural here. But of course we can. It's not uh, super disadvantageous to fight in this choke point. And I think at this point, the game is uh, starting to become pretty unwinnable for, winnable for Poppy. Like he never actually found that expansion. And... Um, since Shadown went for Immortals, he has a pretty similarly good army. So it's starting to not look uh, very good at all. One thing Poppy Joe does have is Blink. But again, I think the Blink is actually not a good choice here. I think it was good against Riser when he went for Stargate. But I think in this position, if you're playing up against someone who has a ground army that has, you know, basically... Uh, no counter to disruptor you should be going for those or potentially even like void ray or something like you need to go for something that's uh strong against ground armies the blink here is just yeah not it's not gonna win you the fight against this four immortal army either i think the idea was to shut down the warp prism but it's just uh 
yeah, I don't think it's super solid overall. So yeah, I think uh, we can maybe stop watching this game. It's kind of over. We're just kind of waiting for uh, for Poppy Joe to, to realize because Shadown just has a much stronger army here. It's not really uh, killable. And then also Shadown is on three bases to one. <laughs> so unless he loses this fight majorly, it's, um, it's pretty much game over. And yeah, Poppy Joe tries this tactic. Maybe that's what he was playing off of with the blink, but Shadown's able to get a decent position. Good enough. Snipe the prism. And yeah, all this fight is not perfect. He just has way too much for Poppy Joe to deal with. And uh, Poppy Joe taps out. And now we have the uh, the main course, I guess we can call it. We have uh, Poppy Joe against a pro gamer. One of the top Protoss. GSL finalist creator. I think this is the best game or best um, matchup to watch if you want to learn is to watch a pro gamer kind of beat up on an amateur <laughs> because they always have the uh, like maximum clean defenses. They don't um, they don't play for a quality like pretty much everybody else has been playing for except for Riser in the first game which um, he didn't win. We saw Shadown play for a kind of a quality, and we saw um, Riser in game two play for a quality with the uh, with the Void Race. And yeah, usually when pro gamers defend, they, they play for advantages. So I'm gonna fast forward here. We can see um, Poppy Joe predictably going for a Robo again. <laughs> no surprise there. And Crater's gonna go for a pretty quick expansion. He's playing like the very standard PvP build, which I've done a guide on, which is just double stalker, double sentry, expansion. And the idea is just you get like enough units to defend. You also get pretty quick scouting. You know, nothing super great against this build. It's not super amazing against anything either, but it just keeps you safe enough to um, to get a quick expansion. So we're gonna see the expansion go down. And one thing I want to point out in Creator's vision, different to uh, Shadown specifically, but also Riser, is the amount of uh, scouting we're doing here. Like, pretty much the whole map has been scouted at this point, except for the top. And um, we also have this probe come back in to Poppy Joe's natural, so we know there's no expansion. So our level of you know awareness of what's going on here is just astronomical. There's just no corner of the map that's uh, unscouted. And we obviously find the Robo because of that. Um, and I want to point out, he did go for the shield battery. Same as um, Riser and Shadown actually. But now that we know it's Proxy Robo, we can cancel. And we also went for a Robo before we saw the Proxy Robo. So this kind of setup is just like a catch-all. Um, if it was Proxy DT, we'd have this. If it was Proxy Stargate, then we would have the, um, the shield battery. We could potentially cancel this and go Twilight, or we could just play for like a Robo push. But regardless of what our opponent was doing in this position, Robo is going to counter everything. So I think this is the best tech choice. We can also see Crater's going for um, quite a few sentries. And this is a pretty big part of the uh, perfect defense because if the Immortals come into here and you have a lot of Stalker only and you cast the Overcharge, they can just run away. But if you go for a lot of sentry, you can trap him. And although he can pick up and leave, you're still going to be able to pick off uh, quite a few units. So I feel like the sentries are a pretty important part of the defense. And this is just um, an insane level of uh, perfection here. <laughs> so we warp in the next two stalker in the main. Because if Poppy Joe pushes the natural, we have the overcharge and the sentries. And so we can pretty much trade... Uh, well against um, anything on that side and the real problem here is going to be the uh, war prism so we can see here that creator is spreading his stalkers out for that and against riser we saw poppy joe kind of obliterating stalkers left and right and here we just see the war prism is just consistently backing up like it, it almost seems like Poppy Joe is just not good with the War Prism, but um, it's actually just Creator is so clutch with his defense. 
He kind of pulls it back as soon as the War Prism comes in. Kind of commits a little bit. And although the Immortals are good against the Stalker, it's just not really too easy to get anything uh, done right now. And also, he's kind of committed to the, the War Prism in the main. So he can't really push the Natural too easily either. So Creator kind of easily pushing that away. And one of the biggest differences here in this setup is that Crater's army is a little bit worse. Like he only has one immortal to two, I believe. But um, it's enough that he's pretty much matching the army like very closely. And he has the expansion. So if Poppy Joe doesn't make a play soon, he's going to um, he's not going to have a very good. Uh, he's going to have the smaller army. And yeah, getting that war prism kill was just like immediately GG. So, <laughs> I mean, watching these four games back to back is just kind of insane. Like. The level of defense at the pro level is just astronomically better than um, than everybody else we watched, including Shadown, who I think had a good idea though. But um, yeah, I mean, this level of defense is just completely obliterating the build. Like, I would never play this build against Crater anymore after seeing this game. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully you guys like this uh, kind of video. Four different levels of defenses. I think you guys should go for this one. <laughs> But uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoy this. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys in the next one. Hey guys, Yu Shang here. Welcome to another StarCraft 2 lesson. Uh, we're playing here against the strongest player I have ever played against and probably ever will um, unless I go and play on the Korean or the European servers I think because this is the number one player on the NA server in fact he's the current NA champion it is Neeb and it's not every day you get to play against Neeb he usually plays on the European server so I don't think I've played Neeb in um, like two years or something. I played him a ton in Legacy of the Void beta and he basically bought me like eight out of 10 games. <laughs> um, but I haven't played him since then. And obviously he's much stronger now. I mean, in the beta, everybody was experimenting with new strategies and stuff. So yeah, right now he's a different beast. He's, I mean, he's the NA champion. So he's taking down Scarlet, he's taking down Astraea. I mean, he's really, he's really good at the video game guys. So anyways, we're playing against Neeb. I'm super high adrenaline right now. Thinking, um, okay, we're, we gotta play our best because then I'm gonna make a video on how Neeb destroyed me. <laughs> so my adrenaline's super high. Um, we're looking around here and Neeb is actually like super annoying. He's harassing my mineral line like crazy, like just constant harass for the first two minutes of the game. Um, so at this point I'm thinking, man, we got to work on our early game because this is just infuriating. Uh, he's way, way better than me at the early game. You can see here my probe is like almost dead. <laughs> Whereas on this side, all my probes are like not mining efficiently. So yeah, it's really, really bad. But okay, so we're both going to go double stalker. Neither of us is going for any adepts. Um, and I think this is more of the meta these days because the double adept, even though it was really insane in the beta, uh, or even like the first year since the beta, it's at this point in the game, it's, uh, you know, everybody just has so much practice against it that it's much safer to go for double stalkers. So yeah, basically doing the same opening. Um, I think right now is where the real differences come in though. So I'm going to be going for a nexus. And he's going to be going for four stalker. So yeah, I'll get the Nexus and then I'm going to get some uh, two more sentries and basically play this from a defensive standpoint, which is kind of the opposite of how I would expect a game against Neeb to go because I mean, Neeb is kind of notorious for uh, being a defensive beast and I am usually playing super hyper aggressive. So yeah, Neeb is taking the aggressive role in this game and I'm actually taking the defensive role. So, yeah, how we can expect this game to go <clears throat> is basically Neeb is going to go for some four stalker pressure. Um, have a little bit of an edge on like map control, 
and what else like potential to do damage whereas i should have a slight eco lead if i defend correctly and then i should have some faster scouting as well is uh traditionally how plain defensive works now because i saw him open up double stalker um with my probe i know that there's a potential for him to go for four stalker pressure already without seeing uh you know what he's doing so because of that i'm going to be going for a shield battery just playing it safe um, and then that way, if he does go for four stalker pressure, which he is, then I can defend. He could also potentially be going for like double stalker, double sentry, just like I am. And so, you know, getting the shield battery is a little bit weakening, but you really got to play things, uh, safe in Starcraft. So we're just going to grab that and then we should be fine if he goes for the pressure. Speaking of, here he comes with this four stalker, uh, poke. And then you can see behind this is just like very light pressure. He's going for a Twilight Council. He's going for some sentries. I really don't like how he set this up, by the way. <laughs> he really didn't like put them in a line at all. <clears throat> but some nice, um, nice focus here. He's trying to drain the shield battery energy so he can come in and um, pick off my stalkers. But nice little force field by me, <laughs> if I say so myself. And yeah, we actually pick off two stalkers. So I'm feeling good right now. I'm like, oh shit, we're uh, we're winning against Neeb here. Let's let's make sure we don't lose this game because uh, we've got a small advantage. Um, the only downside right now after this exchange is that I used up my sentry energy, so I don't have any way of scouting. So I'm kind of blind right now, um, which is unfortunate. And we have no idea that he went for the double sentry follow up. I mean, we can see here obviously a full vision and he did go for double sentry but if you just imagine what he could do with that money uh if he didn't make the sentries he would have you know an extra 200 gas so instead of going for the sentries he could have for example thrown down a dark shrine or he could have for example thrown down like a stargate and started making oracles right and so because of that i kind of need to play this um more safely than i otherwise would have to so because of that, I'm going to be throwing down a shield battery. I'm going to be getting a robo. And even though I picked off two stalkers here, we're kind of losing some of that advantage just because I have to play safe. So it's not it's not perfect. But um, yeah, I think we still have a slight advantage, which is nice. Now, on the other hand, Neeb does not need to do any of that. Um, so Neeb's just going to continue warping in stalkers. And he's going to just be checking if I am going for something crazy, like uh, like the DTs. But he comes in here, he sees the Twilight, he's going to see my Robo. And so from Neeb's perspective, he can basically just um, make Stalkers and take his third base. Like, there's no real worry about any of these, um, you know, cheeky strategies. So I think we're both playing perfectly so far, uh, even though we're doing different things. It's just, yeah, the circumstances for each of us are slightly different. Okay, so now that I have this safety... Oh, I also got a forge. I mean, we're both getting the forge. After this safety, I'm going to go grab my third base. Neeb is going to do the same. We both have about, you know, eight, ten stalkers, something like that. I guess I'm on six and he is on uh, seven. So very similar stalker counts. You basically just want to keep making them if you're trying to figure out how to play PvP. You basically keep making stalkers. Um, as soon as your warp gates are ready, you warp into more. We should see need, need to get another two in a second. Uh, same with uh, me on my side. And then you just want to keep scouting and see if they're doing any sort of all-ins where you would need to get more gates. But you can actually take your third base very safely off of just two gates and continuously warping in stalkers. So my Phoenix comes in here and I see uh, Forge, Twilight... I see, you know, two stalkers being warped in. So basically, he can't be all inning me. Um, he's got to be macroing. So not super worried. Shield battery just in case. But yeah, maybe we don't even need this, honestly. And I think Nave made his first mistake. So I don't... Well, I mean, besides losing the stalkers, obviously. But, uh, you know, more of a st strategic mistake here. He got his shield battery before he got the Nexus. And I think this is not um, a good thing to do unless you just have like no info. But if we go to Neeb's perspective here, he actually has seen my third base already. 
And so because he's seen this, I don't think he should have um, got the shield battery. But yeah, m maybe the idea with the shield battery is that he lost two stalkers earlier. And so he thinks that he needs this. But actually, he really doesn't um, objectively because he's seen my robo and the robo costs the same as two stalkers. And so there's, yeah, there's no reason to get the shield battery until you've got uh, your nexus. So very, very tiny mistake. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't even point this out in my uh, sessions with like a GM student. But yeah, since it's Neeb, I think this is a mistake. Okay, so we basically both confirmed at this point that we have uh, third bases. So at this point in the game, you should be thinking about your transition. The most standard way to go about this position is to go into charge. I would recommend you go charge if you're trying to learn PvP. Um, but I suppose you could also go for, you know, like a Robo Bay. Um, and then maybe grab like four gas or five gas and just play this like stalker disruptor style. I think that would be okay. But this, the, uh, the charge style is way more standard. So that's what I'm going to be doing. And I think that's what Neeb is doing as well in a second. We're also going to be adding some gates, of course. I'm making this nice little wall off. <laughs> it's super extra, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of like this because then the adepts can't shade in as easily. Like they kind of get blocked over here, which is kind of sweet. So this looks very greedy, but just keep in mind, we've both seen that the opponent is playing on two gates only into a third base. So you can kind of extrapolate. They can't really be doing any uh, all ins, right? So that's why you're able to get away with this. And if, you know, you're playing a game on ladder and you do this and then you die and you're like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> it's because you're not really paying attention to the uh, scouting info, right? Like you want to do this up until a point where you see them committing to macro and then it's okay. But I mean, if you don't see them committing to macro, you should be making more stalkers. Right, so this is only if you see your opponent macroing as well. So now... Neeb has deviated from uh, what I thought was standard, or what I do as standard, which is going for the Temple Archives. So I'm kind of setting up for like a, a three base, four gas charge at Archon. Um, but for whatever reason, Neeb is actually playing uh, three gas. And yeah, I honestly don't really get it. I might have to watch some more European PvP, because they were doing what I'm doing, but now they're only doing stalkers. I've seen quite a few pros do that. I'm not really sure why though. Okay, a little exchange here. He's got more stalker than me, but we are able to trade um, pretty evenly actually. Maybe even slightly better because he's losing stalkers and I'm losing zealots. Yes, yeah, so we got like a 300 um, mineral lead here. Some of that's from earlier. Yeah, so he's just on three gas. And he goes for a Dark Shrine and a Robo Bay, which is a lot of gas. So, I mean, this is very confusing to me, actually. I kind of, when I was playing the game, I didn't even look for what he was doing because he only had three gas. So he was basically locked in to, um, like, Stalker, Zealot, maybe Archon, potentially, like one. But yeah, I didn't even scout for any of this tech because it just seems so impossible for him to be going for anything. Um, but yeah, he is getting this. So I mean, if he wants to make Dark Templar and Disruptors, he has to make only Zealot. Because he just doesn't have enough money to make anything else. Whereas on my side, I have four gas. And so I'm able to uh, sneak in some Archons. I think I have like one or two maybe right now. Yeah, the second one's just coming in. And so at this point in the game, my army is way better. So as long as we don't just like let him sit back here and uh, go for an attack, we should be able to beat him. So I'm getting a War Prism. I'm going to go for a push. I thought this would just be some pressure, actually. I thought we would just um, yeah go across the map, see what he's got. And then if he's got a similar sized army, I would just pull back to my fourth, add some cannons, and just kind of play a normal macro game. Let me move this up a bit. So we're setting up for this. We're on like three base saturation basically. And the fourth base is just going to act as um, a place to transfer my probes to. So you can see I'm moving some over here. 
setting up for this attack. And I'm completely ready to just pull back here. <laughs> like right now in the game. Um, I'm thinking I'm about to move command back here. But when I uh, came up on him, I saw that he had zero Archons. And so immediately I was like, okay, I guess we're going for it. We just commit to this. And um, that blink was a little poor because I should have went for the shield battery. But right now I'm just in disbelief because... I mean, we're playing Neve. We're playing, uh, you know, the number one NA player, and he has, like, no units. So I was kind of worried. Like, what is he going for? Like, why do I have such a massive army lead right now? Where <laughs> we're, like, having no no contest in this fight. Um, so I was thinking, like, okay, maybe there's Dark Templar or something. So I'm thinking about, okay, I have an Observer over here. We're good. Just don't lose our War Prism. I was really worried about that, actually. But we were able to kind of maneuver it there and save it. And then, yeah, I was just thinking, like, he's probably going to have some Disruptor coming or Dark Templar or... I don't know. He's got to have something else, right? So, yeah, the Dark Templar showed up. And I pulled back. I'm making, like, an Observer right now and I'm adding some cannons. And I almost lose the game right now, actually. Or uh, maybe not lose the game, but make it really a lot closer than it should be. Because I left my army here on a move command. <laughs> and there's a disruptor on the way. And what I should have done is move commanded it like way over here. Or even back to the middle of the map. Although that would be not as good because there's a, a choke point here. But I should have moved it away. I definitely should not have left it here um, while I go make cannons. This is like a cardinal rule you guys can follow actually. Is if you're not going to look at your army, send it home. Or send it really far away. Because if you're not watching it, shit like this can happen. And luckily, I think I looked back there exactly as that shot. So I was able to target fire it with my Zealot Stalker. Um, <laughs> and it barely went down. So I think I ate my tongue there. But we're good. We're, uh, we're okay. I just need to back up, um, collect my Observer. And then we can come back in, hopefully, for the kill. So here we go. As I came back in, I saw this Archon Morphine, so I target fire that as well. Um, just to make sure it doesn't get any shots off. Usually that type of micro is bad, but in this situation it's actually good. And then this Disruptor didn't do too much just because my units are so spread. And I think Neeb looks over there, saw that Disruptor went down, and he taps out. So I actually beat Neeb. Which was insane. I Going into this game, I thought we were going to get an absolute beatdown. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we beat Neeb, so I was super pumped. I think I was more pumped for this than like anything in the past three or four years. Um, the, the, the last moment I remember being this pumped was actually my local tournament at Baseline. Like my first win at, um, at a StarCraft II tournament, so... Yeah, super amazing game. Really, really happy and surprised that I won this game. Um, but I think that's all for today, guys. So hopefully you enjoyed this analysis. If you got some questions on PvP, you can either leave them in the comments or uh, get a direct list with me on my website, hushangcoaching.com. And I think that's it, guys. So yeah, I will see you in the next one. Hey guys, Hu Shang here. Welcome to another StarCraft 2 lesson. We're going to be doing a voiceover today of a game I played on stream. And it's a pretty awesome macro game against Zora, yeah, who is um, who was like 5'6 in this game. But we played him again later in the day and he was already 5'8. And it wasn't that too long after, which means he won like every single one of his matches. <laughs> so this guy... Probably some previous uh, top 16 Zerg GM, I'm guessing. Not sure who it is, but uh, yeah, we had a fun little game here. So what I'm going to be doing is just doing a voiceover and uh, kind of explaining my thoughts. Uh, I was thinking of just posting the video of the game, but I was pretty quiet. So we'll do this instead so you guys can get some tips. All right, so getting to the game here. 
we have a really standard opening from my opponent. You can see the pool is just finishing here at like two minutes, which is basically what you want to see. So you can play a uh, standard. If you see a pool earlier than that, then you're really going to want to try and figure out exactly what he's doing. There's a lot of aggressive stuff they can go for, of course. So this, this game I'm going to open up with um, one of the builds I used to do, which is like a charge lot opening. It's kind of like an easy version of the Adept build that was really popular a couple years ago. So if you guys want to do um, like a super easy aggressive builder, I would highly recommend this one. Um, maybe I could even do a guide on it if you guys want that. So we go Twilight, then we get a Robo. One extra unit for safety here, so one Stalker, one Adept. Oh, actually, I changed it to a Zealot here just to maximize the number of Zealots we have. And then we're going to go for our gates and then charge. So this is something that people often uh, mess up is they go for the charge first, which seems intuitive, right? Like you want to get the charge done as quickly as possible. But it actually makes a lot more sense to go for the, um, the gates first because the charge is such a quick upgrade. You can easily get that complete in time anyways. And uh, getting those gates done fast and getting the zealots warped in is more critical. It's a nice little tip for you guys there, if you do this build or the Adept build. Works with Adepts as well. And now we're getting the War Prism. The Zerg doesn't really know what we're doing, I think. I mean, they see the Robo, so they might be thinking DTs. But in this case, we're going for Charge Lots, so it's, it's a bit different. If you play against DTs, you actually want to go kind of like Queen Zergling. And then you can get a bigger Eco, because DTs aren't really that big of a commitment. But against this build, you need to be going for a lot of roaches. So, similar look, but very different response from the Zerg. Not really talking too much about what Zerg's doing, because it, it honestly doesn't really matter as long as you see their third base. Like, you don't really have to be worried about uh, their cheeses or, or anything else yet. So, we come in here with the Zealots. I'm a bit rusty with this build, so uh, we're kind of late, actually. Usually... I think I had another warp in already at 4.30, this one. Whereas we're hitting this at 4.40, it looks like. <laughs> Almost got our prism taken out there. But okay, we finally get the Zealots warped in, and we're going to go for a push. And yeah, the Zerg already has quite a few Zerglings, but if they don't have Roaches, we can maybe get some damage in here. So he's got like... A couple roaches. It's not the end of the world. Like, you might be looking at this and thinking, oh man, this game is completely over. And I won't lie to you and say it's good, but if the Zerg has that many units at this time in the game, that definitely means that they uh, significantly cut their drones. And so I, I would estimate the Zerg's at like 38 workers. And we're at 44. So even though we lost all those units, it's not as bad as it seems. So if you get in these positions often with Protoss, and you're thinking, oh man, Zerg has three bases and they held my attack, I'm screwed. It's not It's not that simple, because the Zerg needs to have a good drone count as well. It just appears on the mini-map that the Zerg is you know, expanding a lot, but it doesn't really mean that they're winning. So be careful if you're making assumptions based on like how much area they have on the mini-map. That's very uh, misleading oftentimes. Have a sip of my coffee here. Okay, so the the next game plan is to get some immortals since he's going for roaches. And I'm also going to add in some sentries. I think the sentries, like you could go straight to Archon or Storm, which is also uh, good sometimes. But I feel like the sentry is actually very good against roaches. Um, if you don't make that against roaches, then it it's, it's actually kind of hard to, um, to force a fight against them because they can cut your zealots. So sentries are kind of a critical component if you're not making those. Or a storm. Either or. I was kind of expecting him to all in. Um, I think I played him, he didn't all in before. Or maybe I'm just a chicken, but I'm uh, getting double shield battery here just in case. We are a little bit behind. Just poking him, getting our basic uh, upgrades and stuff. One thing I see really often is people rushing upgrades. So if you're struggling against like any race, 
you should just consider delaying your upgrades a little bit. They're really not as critical as people make them out to be. You can oftentimes just not get upgrades for a really long time. Like we're just starting plus one here. You don't see me going double forwards either. Stuff like that is really um, not that important, especially with Protoss specifically. Okay, so he's getting his fourth. Now, kind of similar to earlier where you, you don't want to like um, read into them getting the base too much. Just because Zerg gets a fourth doesn't mean they're going to 80 drones. So in this position here, you want to be watching their drone count more than you want to be reading into their hatch timing. Right? So if you go over that fourth hatch and you see they have like 20 drones there at their fourth, then you can be assured they have gone up to a really high drone count. But if you go over the fourth and there's no drones there at all, you should be thinking that they're doing an all-in, even though they got the fourth. So in this case, he's droned up pretty hard. So we're going macro. He's also built a crazy amount of Ravagers, so I'm not really worried about something like Muta or, um, you know, fast lurkers. So there's no real reason for us to push here, uh, like, committedly, right? Faking is fine, which is what we're going to do here, is just kind of get across, make him think we're coming, and then go home. But you don't, you don't really want to push into someone who made that many Ravager, because they're investing all their money into not dying into a sweet army. Okay, so I come all the way back. We've set ourselves up pretty nicely, I think, considering the opening. And now we're going to be going up to 16 gateways, which seems like an insane number. But if you're making charge at Archon, you really need that many. Now, post game, I've been playing quite a few macro PVZs and I think I'm taking my 5th base a little bit quickly. I think the strongest way you can play this out, although I still have to test it some more, is to just go for the 4th base gases and kind of just sit here a little longer till maxed. Um, or, I mean, maybe not exactly maxed, but maybe like 180 supply with some AoE. And I think in this game I go for a little bit of a faster 5th, which it's okay in this one, but it, it, it does tend to be a little bit uh, sketchy to hold some pushes. Yeah, he can't really push into me too easily here because the force fields are so strong. So the plan is just to um, kind of trap as many as we can, trade out, and just keep uh, keep getting higher in supply. Because Protoss does better when you get closer to maxed. So you don't want to be pushing too aggressively into Zerg at this point in the game, especially when they're playing Roaches. Like, Roaches are not a unit that gets better over time. They only get worse. Same with like zealots and stuff. So if your opponent's making a lot of roaches, then just let them. Don't feel like you have to kill those roaches because it's, it's actually more on your opponent to get rid of them than it is for you to kill them. So finally, we were able to get our fourth base, our fifth base, I, I mean. And yeah, at this point, I want to start getting more aggressive. Um, it wasn't my intentions to play late game in this uh, match at least ultra late game. I kind of wanted to end it in this mid game phase. So I'm going to start doing some really heavy aggression here as we get the fifth and try to see if we can maybe kill him now. So he's starting to get aggressive. We're going to start going into the, um, the Stargates. And basically what he's doing right now in, in, um, or what I, what I think he's doing is he's trying to get rid of these units because of what I said earlier. They're not good anymore. And if he's stuck on these forever, we're just going to uh, win, right? Because my army is so much stronger. Especially if I added something like Disruptor here, right? Like if I, if we, if our army stay exactly the same, but I get two Disruptor, then he's just completely screwed. So what he's trying to do is get rid of these units and then get into something a bit better, like Broodlords, for example, which we can tell he's doing because he's making Corruptor. So he's trying to get rid of them, trying to get into Broodlords. I think I messed this situation up a little bit. He's got a lot of um, spine crawlers and stuff, so he's making it difficult. But I think what I needed to do right now is just get my army more split up. I thought we could just push a base and, and um, yeah, force him to fight us. But he made it quite challenging with um, 
like the roach is constantly pushing me. So the zealots weren't able to clean up these spines very well. And so next time what I would do is uh, just split up my army a little bit more. With these zealots kind of hitting one base and then the rest of the army hitting another base. So he is able to clean up my army here. We definitely had a good position before this. So I probably should have won here um, with perfect play. But since we didn't, we're going to go late game now. There's not really any way for us to like, um, you know, continue playing ground in this position because he's going into Broodlords. So if you if you try to keep playing ground from this position right here, you're going to get into some trouble. So make sure you transition when you need to. I think we just needed to, uh... So it, it's it's not anything crazy. We don't like to only need to make air units, but we do need to start going Tempest basically to deal with those. So that's the plan now. We have a lot of time we can buy as well. Like, um, I've coached a couple students who are in situations like this, and the Zerg just attacks them with, like, you know, Mass Roach and a couple Broodlords. And you don't really need to worry about that too much because Stalker Archon Zealot is still, like, pretty decent when the Broodlords are in low numbers. And in worst case scenario, you can always base trade them, which is really underrated tactic in StarCraft 2. <laughs> just take your whole army and go A move all their bases. And if they're playing something like this where they're playing Roach, what ends up happening is um, they kill a bunch of your stuff, but your, your Stargates can still make air units, right? So like eventually you're going to have, let's say, three carriers, and then that'll shut down their whole Roach army. And if all their bases are dead and you shut down their Roach army, then you win, right? So it's more complicated than it seems for the Zerg to kind of uh, come kill you. So they'll have to like come back and chase you when you start the base trade and then they, you know, stop their attack. So you just leave and um, you can kind of do that over and over again and they're never really able to um, end the game. So you can kind of drag it out like that. That's why he's being so safe here. So I'm trying to figure out right now how I can trade out this army because kind of similar to what he was doing earlier, I need to start getting the uh, carriers. So I'm trying to set up a nice push here. It was difficult to find this positioning, but we were able to get a a split there, and um, he was kind of at a position, so we were able to snipe that. But it's it's not so easy actually to to transition because if I if I push one of his bases on the left or right here, he has like six spine crawlers, and that'll make us trade super inefficiently. So we're entering this phase where it's like I could push him, but it's it's like not good, you know. So instead, we're just kind of clearing creep a little bit, trying to split up our zealots in case he wants to um, push me, and then I can counterattack. Just very slow tactical play, basically. There's not too much um, drama we can create right now, unfortunately. That's my favorite, guys. StarCraft drama. Alright, so... He's got some infestors. I'm a little bit worried with the um, the zealots, but I felt like this was a good moment to um, maybe get rid of these. And we were able to get the base and then just recall. And also, it might not seem like a big deal, but I was able to clear up almost all of his creep, which um, I think is quite nice once you get into the Broodlord phase because it makes it way harder for him to spread his spores um, and, and kind of spot your army movement. So I was pretty happy about this. We got some Tempest coming in, and he was able to kind of trade these Roaches for quite a few Zealots. So that wasn't ideal, but I, I, uh, I do kind of get like a pretty sweet block here, which I was pretty happy about. Got to be careful. Again, he's still got those Infestors, so we're poking around there. But we're trying to be super, super careful not to go through any choke points. Now, at this point, we're really focused on getting a good army comp. You don't want to mass too many trash units here because it starts to become almost exclusively about who has the better army. So instead of, um, you know, making like stalkers here and, and just trying to deny this base forever, instead what we're going to do is try to start crafting the perfect army. So 
these stalker zealots are no longer useful. We're going to try to get rid of those. And we're going to replace them with like maybe carriers, maybe uh, void ray, storm. Any of like the top tier units is what you want. And that's that's like the majority of what late game is if you're um, sub GM. Is just crafting a better army than your opponent. Like I'll, I'll watch so many games in Diamond and Masters where the end game army is like carrier stalker and okay the carriers are good but the stalkers are uh, just complete garbage right so if you have a lot of money just start even killing your own units or just throwing them away at bases and just replace them with better stuff that's like 95% of late game so that's what I'm trying to do that's what my opponent is trying to do he's being a little bit more efficient than me in this case he was able to snipe a couple bases but he's trying to get rid of his roaches in an efficient way so he can make better units it's kind of forcing me to make zealots here too, which is not ideal. Because now I have to get rid of those as well. So I got this little like stalker zealot group on the, the left. The idea with those was, again, to get rid of them. But also get a little bit of damage. Got to be careful here. He's got the broodlords. They were on the left there. I think I said that on the stream. The Broodlords, I saw them with my ob Observer on the left side here in the Watchtower. And so that's why we were able to go through um, and clear that creep there and not worry too much. But if there were Broods there and Infestors, you got to be really careful because they can catch you kind of at any moment. And there's really no way to get out without recall. So, yeah, be really careful moving on creep at this part of the game. I think it's much stronger to just kind of clear the edges and, um, and play super slow with Protoss. Like, endgame is all about patience. So we're starting to get a lot of the upgrades. We're securing the bottom part of the map. And I'm going to take this left base because I feel like he's kind of relying on, on this particular base to, um, yeah, to mine from. And so if I can just, like, place a nexus here, get a couple shield battery and some cannons, it could be a really nice staging ground to push him. Also, he has no idea I have the tower, apparently. <laughs> so we're getting some really nice uh, pickoffs here with the uh, the Tempest. Now, when this fight starts in a second, I want you guys to focus on um, my Templar usage because I was doing this wrong for quite a while where I would use Storm almost exclusively. And you can definitely still use Storm, but you got to be careful because if you Storm your Interceptors too much, you're actually kind of hurting yourself. And so it's it's good to Storm, but it's more important to feed back their Spellcasters, I would say. So if you have the choice between, you know, Storming Infestors or Feedbacking, uh, Corruptor, or yeah, Storming Corruptors, Feedbacking Infestor, Viper, I would definitely um, Feedback the, the Viper especially. So we're starting to get some cannons. It kind of puts a timer on him, I think, because if we just secure this top left side of the map with some cannon shield better, he's really never going to take a new base. You can see me trying to feed back there. Didn't quite get them. But we're, we're looking for them. Now right here, I was like, where's my mothership? <laughs> I need one of those. But I had one. It's already in the bottom right. I'm going to bring that over. You should definitely make a mothership. It's not minus 400, 400 all the time. <laughs> At least the Zerg has to kind of, uh, you know, take it out. Because if they don't, it's it's a little bit tricky to micro the um, overseers without them all dying. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this battle. But we're basically targeting with the Tempest on the Brutes. And then the Archons are actually the ones that are dealing with the Corruptor right now. And that was a bad storm, actually. I, I realized as soon as I did it. Okay, we need to focus on the feedbacks here, like I was saying. This is way more important. We take out all the infestors. And then you'll see, like, the Voidory Archon is totally sufficient to deal with the Corruptor. And the, the Tempest Carrier can deal with the Broods. So this is a much more efficient way to do it, where your units all have um, very clear and efficient roles. And then we spam some Stalkers just to uh, end the fight. And um, we're able to take a nice victory here against a... Super high GM Zerg player. 5700 actually, it looks like. 
So uh, yeah, hopefully you guys learned some stuff from this voiceover. I will see you guys in the next lesson. Have a good one.